Welcome to Dartmouth College. My name is Andrew Samwick, and I am the director of the Nelson A. Rockefeller Center and a professor in the Department of Economics here at Dartmouth. We at the Rockefeller Center are pleased to bring you today's Democratic Gubernatorial Candidate Forum, featuring candidates Molly Kelly and Steve Marchand. In its 35-year history, the Rockefeller Center has hosted candidates for statewide and federal offices many times in pursuit of its mission to foster campus dialogue about policy issues and promote understanding of policy issues in the community beyond Dartmouth. This evening's forum will be moderated by Professor Charles Whelan, a senior lecturer and policy fellow at the Rockefeller Center. I would like to take a moment to briefly introduce Charlie, who will in turn introduce the two candidates. Professor Charlie Whelan is a member of the Dartmouth class of 1988 and has been teaching courses in economics, public policy, and education at his alma mater full-time since 2012. He holds a master's in public affairs from Princeton University and a PhD in public policy from the University of Chicago. Earlier in his career, he was the Midwest correspondent for The Economist magazine for five years, and he taught several courses on the understanding of the policy process for the master's students at Chicago prior to joining the faculty at Dartmouth. Charlie brings a PhD's background and a journalist's approach to the study of public policy. The results are the deep admiration of Dartmouth students and an impressive range of articles and books that make serious topics more accessible and even fun. His first two books, Naked Economics, Undressing the Dismal Science, and Naked Statistics, Stripping the Dread from the Data, were instant classics. He followed them most recently with Naked Money, What It Is and Why It Matters. Beyond the thinking and writing that academics do, Charlie has not shunned the political limelight. He wrote the centrist manifesto, calling for, quote, an insurgency of the rational, and founded the centrist party to move those ideas forward. In March of 2009, Charlie ran an unsuccessful bid for Congress as the representative from the Illinois 5th District in the special election to replace Rahm Emanuel. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Charlie Whelan. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out, and special thanks to our two candidates. Let me outline the broad parameters of this discussion, and then we'll turn it over to the candidates. We will start with opening statements from the two candidates. There was actually a coin toss backstage with the winner opting to go second. So first, we will have Molly Kelly, and then Steve Marchand will go second. I will introduce them both before that begins. Those will be opening statements of about five minutes. From there, I will ask a few questions to get the roundtable discussion going. And after that, I will turn to this very large stack of questions that you offered on the way in. You'll have to forgive me two things. One is I'm because I just received them, I'm going to flip through. I've already seen that there's certain commonalities, so I'll try and look for themes across the questions. And also forgive me that my eyeglasses got run over by a car last week, so this is a, this is a backup set that's not quite as good. So I will be struggling to read while this is all going on. At about 5.45, we will turn it over for open questions. So if your question here didn't get addressed or you didn't have time to write down a question, there are microphones on both sides, and we'll alternate for as long as we can. We have a hard stop at 6 o'clock. The idea here is to just have a discussion, to have the candidates provide an opportunity to elucidate the issues that are likely to come up. So with that, please let me introduce our two candidates. Uh, speaking first will be Molly Kelly. Molly Kelly served five terms in the New Hampshire State Senate from 2006 to 2016, representing the Keene area. She grew up as the second of 11 children and learned an important lesson. If one is to succeed, then all must succeed. As a single mother of three, Molly worked her way through Keene State College and then Franklin Pierce Law Center, managing apartments, waitressing, delivering newspapers to make ends meet. She knows firsthand that education and job training are opportunities for people to provide for themselves, for their families, and for their communities. Molly's record as a state senator is one of a strong progressive committed to making a difference. She has a daughter, three sons, and seven grandchildren. She lives in Harrisville with her husband, Art Liptowski. Steve Marchand was born and raised in a French-speaking family in Manchester, the son of immigrants from Quebec. Steve's family worked very hard to get into the middle class, moving frequently in and around the west side of Manchester. He received a BS in international relations and a BA in public affairs from Syracuse University.
University in 1996. He went on to receive a master's in public administration from the Maxwell School, also at Syracuse. As a small business person, Steve helped perform audits of local, county, and state government departments across America. In 2003, Steve was elected to the Portsmouth City Council at the age of 29 and later became mayor, quickly earning a statewide reputation across the political spectrum for bringing his government auditing background to elected office. So thank you both again. And Molly, if you could please thank start. You. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlie. And thank you to Dartmouth College and Rockefeller Center. Thank you. It's great to be here. I was just going to say, how's everybody doing? But I can hear you're doing just great. So I am Molly Kelly, and I am running for governor of New Hampshire because I am deeply, deeply concerned about the direction of New Hampshire under our current governor, Chris Sununu, and I want to change that. For me and for many of the people in New Hampshire that I meet every day and that I served as 10 years in the State Senate, we know that what we want is we want a New Hampshire that works for everyone, where everybody has a chance to succeed and not just a few. As Charlie mentioned, I'm number two of 11 children. I was the oldest daughter, too, so that gives me a little bit of credit. And we did learn. I learned early on, very early on, a value that has stayed with me forever. And that value is that if one of us is to succeed, we all must succeed. And as I move into the governor's seat, I will take that same value. I will take that value because I believe if one of us in New Hampshire is to thrive, we must all thrive. I also see that uh, all of New Hampshireites and myself uh, included believe deeply that we want a New Hampshire that provides education and training so that we all have an opportunity to move forward in our life with skills and education. Education is personal to me. Today, as Charlie said, I have a wonderful husband, four children, seven grandchildren. But there was a time in my life where I was a single mom. And I had three little children. And I knew, I knew that if I did not go back and finish my education, I would not be able to provide for them as I wanted to. That doors wouldn't be open for me to move forward in my life, or doors open for my children to move forward. So I did work hard. As Charlie said, I managed departments at the college I attended, which was Keene State College. And I waitressed a night a week. I cleaned laundry rooms, and I even had a rural paper route on Saturday mornings. But I did that because I knew there would be hope and a future. And I want to bring that hope and future to everyone here in New Hampshire as governor. And that's what's important to me. So you can imagine how disappointed I was in this last legislative session when I saw our governor push forth and work so hard to push forth a school voucher program. It didn't work, it didn't pass because of so many of the great people here who voted against it and it didn't get to his desk. But he has said that if re-elected, it will be his signature piece of legislation and we know that because Betsy DeVos has been here to stand with him. It's unacceptable and it's wrong for New Hampshire. It takes money from our public schools and it moves it to private and religious schools. It weakens public education and it would, ra would raise our property taxes. I want to strengthen public education. That's what's important to me. I want to take those 3% of those tax breaks worth over $100 million. I want to invest it in education, job training, affordable college. We need a state where we welcome our young people. I want to put forth policy for young people so that they will stay here and, and work here and come to New Hampshire. We have businesses who are telling us every day we need an educated and a prepared workforce, and we have young people who are telling us there's no opportunity. So we need policies like broadband across this whole state, bring rail to New Hampshire, make college affordable, expand our state loan repayment program to include many, many public service and other industries in our state. We need to bring and be a leader in net neutrality in this state right here in New Hampshire. We must pass, and I will make sure that we pass, the Paid Family Medical Leave Act, which really is a core of our values of who we are here in New Hampshire. It is, it is a piece of legislation that needs to be in law because it tells, it really defines who we are. If there are people in our life who need us at a critical time in their life, we have a right to be with them. If we don't, who are we? 
We also need to know that we will have clean air and clean water in this state, and the, we need to be able to do that by weaning ourselves from fossil fuels and expanding renewable energy. In the Senate, I put together a piece of legislation, bipartisan, got it passed and signed into law. It was the first group net metering bill that has provided and propelled hydro and solar in the state. I am proud of that, but very disappointed, very disappointed in our governor who vetoed a bill recently that all the bill was asking for was to expand that cap so that communities like Hanover, who have a wonderful plan for energy, could move forward and produce high hydro and solar in your communities that would provide lower energy costs, increased job growth, and lower property taxes. That's what we need to do. We need to expand renewable energy across this state. I will also say that we are at a very dangerous time in history. Donald Trump said if he was elected that he would nominate someone to the Supreme Court to overturn Roe versus Wade, and that's what he has done. Chris Sununu, our governor, signed a letter recently with other governors and sent it to, <laughs> sent it to the U.S. Senate uh, saying that he supported that nomination. That's wrong, and we have to be really vigilant to make sure that, uh, that that does not happen. And let me tell you what's even more important is that state leadership will become more important so that we can protect a woman's right to choose here in our own state. I will just end with saying my values are who I am. They have been my values since I mentioned to you as a young child and through the Senate. And I am proud of my Senate record. I am proud of my Senate record. I have always stood with public education. I have championed women's rights, women's reproductive rights, and I will stand with Planned Parenthood every single day. Thank you. I, I, I stood, up, I stood up for common sense gun safety when we weren't even talking about it. And I will be there for working families and children because that's who I am, that's who I know, that's the work I want to do. Being progressive and being bold is not new to me. It's what I have been doing my entire life. And I want to build on that. I'm so thrilled to be here to have this conversation with you tonight and to work with you to uh, always, always ask for your vote. But if we can work together move New Hampshire forward so that every, everyone in New Hampshire has an opportunity to move forward and be successful, not just a few. Thank you so much. So thank you for being here this evening. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good, thank you. Uh, and I appreciate you setting this up this evening. I want to take a step back, at least at the introductory portion of this, to underscore the magnitude of the moment that we are in. Uh, I'm 44 years old, and that means I was born seven months after, uh, I was seven months old when Richard Nixon resigned. My entire life has been in the post-Watergate era. And this is the messiest American politics have been since that time. In the history of this country, about every 40 years, it gets really messy. And at those key moments, we need people who will define the future. This is one of those moments. The last time we had it, as a lifelong Democrat, I am sad to say, it ended up being the conservatives. It ended up being Ronald Reagan, who led the definition of what American politics would look like for the next 40 years. To the present time, we pay for the consequences of that moment in time. It is why Judge Kavanaugh has a very good chance of becoming Justice Kavanaugh. And it means that the goalposts over the last 40 years in virtually all areas of public policy have moved rightward. And so this is the moment where anybody running for major office, federal or in this case governor, needs to understand that if we do not work and speak and act and define in the most forceful terms possible, because those are the terms on which it's getting forced down to us right now, then the next 20 to 40 years will continue to move the goalposts in a direction that I know we, and I suspect a lot of you, think will be detrimental to the future of this country, un-American in many cases. And so, right now, we have to figure out 
for those folks that are figuring out for themselves what it's gonna to mean to be a Democrat, a New Hampshireite, an American. They are looking for guidance. They want us to do better than not be Donald Trump, to not be Chris Sununu, to not be Paul Ryan, to not be a Republican. They want to know what we are in the most specific terms. Having specific plans after 300 town halls and thousands of conversations of 18 plus months going around this state, it turns out it is a feature, not a bug. It turns out people want to know, and then even people that voted for, say, Romney and then Clinton, they are ready to call the Democratic Party their home if we lead, if we define the future. So let's define the future. We'll do it over the next hour, but in a few areas. In education, right now the goalposts are set up that success is when we push back on the privatization of public education dollars. But that should not be the definition of success. We are one of six states that do not offer state funding for pre-K. We have the highest in-state tuition in America. Until the conversation moves from cross your fingers and hope we can freeze in-state tuition to debt-free college for in-state students who attend post-secondary education, we will not be working with the level of force that we need to in order to fundamentally change the conversation on education. On guns, I do not own an orange vest and I do not hunt. And if you do, that's okay. And if you don't, that's okay too. But it is not enough for us to say common sense gun reform in the hopes that people in the middle will come our way. It turns out that a few miles from here in Lebanon, at the stairs of City Hall, I gave a seven point plan and there were about 20 people with guns, including AR-15s that showed up at that event to tell me what I could do with their AR-15. <laughs> and I told them red flag law. And I told them 48 hour wait period and universal background checks, including on private sales and reinstate the concealed carry permitting process. And if you don't want guns on your school grounds, you should be able to not have guns on your school grounds. And AR-15s, <laughs> and, and AR-15s and similar weapons of war do not belong in the hands of civilians. It is okay to say that. It turns out that when you do, people that you do not think are on your side, they are. They've just been waiting for somebody, some party, to say it out loud. On abortion rights, that came up, and this is critically important. Within an hour of when I heard that Justice Kennedy was retiring, we went to work to look at what the best run states in America do on this issue. We cannot wait to see if Roe v. Wade is overturned. And so we put together, several days later, a three-point plan. We should codify it into law. The state of Washington had arguably the best language. We have mimicked much of that language. There are three punitive laws on the books. They do nothing to make abortion safe or even rarer. All they do is they are punishing to those that are in the most difficult situations at a moment where they need access most. We should repeal those three laws. And the third, I am the only candidate in the history of gubernatorial politics in New Hampshire who will say out loud what I think many of us are wishing somebody would say out loud. Repeal the Hyde Amendment because it turns out that if you have more money, you should not get more choice. And the majority of New Hampshireites agree with that as well. Another, the pledge. I have lived in this New Hampshire all my life. I'm from Manchester with an aunt up in Pittsburgh. I've been a mayor over in Portsmouth. The pledge is the politics of the past. We shall be the party of the future. We act as if Mel Thompson's still the governor of New Hampshire. We act like Bill Loeb still runs the union leader. I've done the data, I've checked it out. It turns out Mel Thompson, not the governor. Bill Loeb doesn't run the union leader. The union leader does not run the state of New Hampshire. If we don't get, I'd love to get us in the 21st century. I do audits for a living, but I would settle for the 20th century. <laughs> we are the most inefficiently antiquated run system of government of any state in America. Say it out loud. You'd be surprised how many Republican school board chairs agree with us. They want to know that our party isn't just sharing their values. We do. They want to know we're good at math. <laughs> Campaign finance reform. I am the first candidate in at least 25 years who has said what you know, most of you know to be true. If you want to fix a campaign finance system that is fundamentally broken, the only way you will do it is not by saying get the dark money out of politics. I don't have any corporate money in my campaign. I don't take money from fossil fuel executives. 91% of my money is from in-state and my average contribution is 65 bucks. That's great. That and three bucks will get you a cup of coffee. You know what we need? Public financing of elections. It is the only way to fix a system that is broken. 
We'll talk about a lot more issues, including energy and others, I hope. But here's the thing. That last time, it was messy. It was Ronald Reagan who said that the way to get Democrats, Republicans, and independents together for a durable, lasting, governable coalition that would last for 40 years was not by blurring differences, avoiding specificity, sounding apologetic about what you believe in. It turns out, he said, it was with a banner of bold, unmistakable colors with no pale pastel shades. He was right, and what he's done, and his party has done for 40 years since then has been detrimental to this country. If we do not lead with a banner of bold, unmistakable colors with no pale pastel shades. If we do not define the future, somebody else will. I'm running for governor because that is unacceptable. I plan on being in this state at least another 44 years, God willing. And in the meantime, I know we can be the best state in America to start and raise your family, to start and grow a business. We can be an aspirational party that defines and builds a coalition that will represent the best of what we can be, not the worst of what we've been. I appreciate being here tonight. Look forward to your questions. We'll now move to shorter questions, about a minute each, and we're going to reverse the order. So this will go to Steve first. It's clear that there are a lot of investments that we can make in human capital and preschool education, job training. Those things are going to be even more important as artificial intelligence comes along, the opioid crisis, mental health, and so on. At the same time, New Hampshire is a state where citizens have historically expressed an interest for small government and low taxes. So how would you reconcile these two competing realities? Most of your Republican friends are not anti-government. They are anti what they fear is inefficient, ineffective, non-data driven, non-outcome oriented government. I'm not talking about the folks on Fox News. I'm talking about the people in your neighborhood. They voted for Romney, a lot of them, and then they voted for Clinton, but without excitement because they feel the Republican Party has left them. We have conflated fiscal conservatism and fiscal responsibility as if they are the same thing. Delivering outcomes at the best price possible in a sustainable way, that is the definition of fiscal responsibility. As an auditor and a former mayor, it gives me the ability to say difficult but necessary things. So when we say don't take the pledge, look, it's going to take more than two years to get out of the hole that's a century in getting to this point. But culturally, let us begin. We need additional revenue. And that means reverse the business profits tax. It's 100 million bucks a year. Increase the gas tax by four cents a gallon. That's about 30 million bucks a year. Legalize, regulate, and tax cannabis, as I've been saying for years. That's about 35 million dollars a year. And then at the local level, we should do what at least 17 states have done and allow circuit breakers. We all acknowledge that income is the best uh, way to determine your ability to pay taxes. At the local level, we should do what many states do, which is allow income to be a significant element in figuring out your tax liability. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I just want to say, when we, when we talk about investments in the state, and yes, we talk about a lot of issues and what we want to invest in. I think people are probably very clear that my number one investment is education because it is a win-win. It is the wisest investment that we can make with the greatest return for everyone and those dollars then come back into our revenue and we recycle that once again. I just want to be clear tonight as well that I have um, been clear with voters and I think you have a right uh, as voters to know exactly where uh, candidates stand on issues, and I have been clear that I do not support a sales or an income tax, and there is no one running for governor in this state who does support a sales or income tax, and I understand that to be the pledge. So I just want to be clear. I have been clear about that issue, um, and I want to continue to be clear with you uh, about the same issue. Yes, I do support uh, uh, marijuana to be legalized, regulated, and taxed. Um, I have supported a gas tax, and I believe that our tax breaks that we're receiving, I would repeal those that uh, the Governor uh, Sununu has implemented, and I would repeal those. Thank you. Terrific. And we'll re reverse it again, so this will go back to you. This is, I'm going to the cards because we had a flurry of questions related to energy and climate change. I'll read this one. The world is facing an unprecedented climate crisis. It is a moral imperative that we act aggressively immediately. Yes or no? Do you oppose the Granite Bridge Pipeline? If not, what aggressive climate action will you take that will balance the devastating damage uh, of continuing fossil fuel expansion? 
Is, is that yes. Right. Okay. Uh, yes. Well, just to start with, climate change is real, um, and that I believe that if we are making public policy, it should be back, based on reality, uh, facts, and science. We have a governor who has been pretty very clear. He does not uh, believe that uh, human beings have an effect on our environment, and is, um, as you can see, not supporting the concept of climate change. I would. Um, I, as I said earlier, we need to wean ourselves off of fossil fuel. It's a priority, um, and it's most important that we continue to do that. Uh, I have, uh, as I said, pushed through the first bill for solar renewable uh, to move forward. Uh, as a state senator, one of the things I've learned is that you better know the facts. You better have done all of your research, spoke with uh, the people in the communities where projects will be affected, um, and to make sure that you understand all of the issues and make sure you have all the information in order to make a decision that there won't be unintended consequences. And that's what I am doing today about the Granite Bridge Project. Thank you. Steve? I oppose the Granite Bridge Project. 64% of our electricity comes from natural gas. To add more to the mix is the absolute wrong direction. But look, a lot of what we talk about in the area of public policy and energy is tactical. And so you need to start by going big and then the strategies and the tactics flow from that. So for example, when I asked a lot of folks, I did a lot of research, 300 town hall meetings, thousands of conversations, I've audited cities around the country, you can't do too much homework, and I've done a ton of it. It turns out if you want to move the way that other states, even in New England, have in terms of conservation technology and renewables, two of the big things we can do, which is part of the plan, stevemarchand.com for energy, number one is the renewable portfolio standard, scheduled to go to 25% by 2025, should be 50% by 2030. We know we can do that because other parts of New England are set to do that. It communicates to the market that they should invest in a sustainable way on, uh, on renewables and conservation. The second is eliminate the net metering cap. Other states that have done that have found an explosive growth in solar, uh, and we're talking offshore wind, there's a role for biomass. Look, Vermont's 10% solar, mass 8%. We are, five years after Molly's bill, half of 1%. If we do not make dynamic change occur, we will be left behind. It's an economy that can create 10 to 12,000 jobs in that 11 year period. You'll start on this question. You guys will figure out the pattern soon enough. Sure. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> what will you do, Steve and Molly, to reduce the ideological chasm in the state? Specifically, please. It's and I think the, the, the chasm between the left and the right, not just in this state, but across the country, how will you bring people together? I have tried many times over the years because it feels good. I would like it to be so, to get people to work across the aisle in harmony. In the age of Trump, if we think that if we compromise, that the right will compromise with us, I would like you to meet Chief, uh, I would like you to meet Supreme Court Justice uh, uh, Merrick Garland. I would like you to tell me how that DACA vote that was promised within 90 days of the federal budget being passed, how did that go? I would like to ask you when Chris Sununu said, I am for paid family medical leave, and then we put down a plan that was very mild, very modest, very easy for Chris to get to yes to. When it was getting there, not only did he say he was against it, he used the Mel Thompson throwdown. He said it would lead to a backdoor income tax. He did it anyway. In this era, as Reagan in the late 70s understood, the way to get and I would argue progressive solutions that are going to make this an amazing place to live is not going to be by persuading Chris Sununu and Donald Trump. It will only come by replacing Chris Sununu and Donald Trump. We need to, one last sentence, we need to make in this era, it is a messy era like it was after Watergate, we must make the argument with force and then we must win the argument. Wow. Thank you. Of course we need to all come together. Um, and I started uh, my whole uh, uh, presentation tonight with the fact that uh, uh, we need to defeat and to unseat Chris Sununu. In the end, in the end, all of us as Democrats must come together to make sure that's our goal. But when we're out there and we're talking with people who we disagree with, and things are tough, people are having trouble with conversations today, we need to be able to listen to each other. I know in the, when I was working to bring forth uh, bills and to pass legislation, we all had to listen. And then we had to see where we could compromise, but never, never compromise our values. But we are a party of caring people. 
We are a party that understands each other. And what is important is we take those values of who we are and we work together, listening to each other, understanding where someone else may come from and get something done so that it's for the good of all of the people in this state and nationally as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to use my moderator's prerogative and give you each two minutes for this next question. Oh What's your program to deal with the opioid epidemic? If you, two minutes should be plenty for that, I think. <laughs> uh, Molly, if you would begin. Yes, this uh, obviously um, is, is such a serious, serious issue. It is not new to us here in New Hampshire. It's not new to many of us who have worked on this issue. And I would have to say that probably everybody in this audience has been affected by this epidemic. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to say it is an epidemic. It is an illness. And that we must treat this epidemic like we would any other medical epidemic in this state. People are ill and they need help. We cannot arrest our way out of this epidemic. It was recently Jeff Sessions was here, and I joined others who were uh, there to really uh, uh, speak uh, to the issue of the fact that what we need is for everyone. And there's a young man there, and I just will tell you this brief story first, is he was in uh, recovery, and he was so upset that he didn't have insurance and that the Affordable Care Act may not protect him as he goes forward to be able to receive care. We need to make sure that the Affordable Care Act is strengthened so that those in recovery who want to get better will be able to get better and have access. I will, thank you. I will. You know, I, w I was one of the first in the Senate to really push forth this, the Good Samaritan Bill. I was able to get uh, synthetic drugs off of the streets in our communities, in retail stores. We can talk about that a little bit later. But I was able to do that. So this isn't new. It's about people and about dignity and respect, and it's an illness. We need to take, get rid of the stigma and to really address it. I had the opportunity to uh, be with uh, firefighters one night when they got a call for an overdose. and I. They asked me, come along, and I did. And I got in that fire truck, and I went with them. And I saw what they did, and it was amazing. And they brought someone back to life. And that young woman didn't want to be there. She was sick, she was ill, and she's looking for help. We need a comprehensive program that has prevention, treatment, recovery, fund it, and deal with this epidemic so that many, many people and all of you can move forward with your lives and not have to be so affected with such a detrimental, dangerous, and deadly epidemic. Thank you. So uh, one of the benefits of doing as much travel the way that I've campaigned over the last couple of years is uh, you think you're teaching, right? Who is this guy? Why does he want to be governor? What would he do? It ends up being much more of a learning experience for the candidate if you're doing it right. And so I've had a chance to spend a lot of time at recovery centers around the state and with individuals sometimes completely out of that context who come up and tell me about their struggle in long-term recovery. And so I look for patterns. Kind of goes back to my auditing days, I guess. And here's the thing. I love doing this exercise where I'll sit down with somebody who uh, runs a recovery center, and I'll ask them to show me their current budget, and then I'll ask them to uh, help me write out their dream budget. It is an amazing exercise. And the thing that I quickly learned by doing it was that the gap between the current budget and the dream budget was much smaller than I would have guessed as a layman when I began doing this. Uh, and that is both exciting and incredibly frustrating <laughs> because you realize that in a lot of these centers, a difference of 150, $250,000, $350,000 a year, by the way, our state budget approaches $6 billion a year. 53% of people in the last UNH survey said it was the number one problem facing New Hampshire. And when I did the math, for an additional six to $8 million a year of sustainable funding, you could make these budgets approach the dream budget rather than the struggling budget that they cobble together now. So it's not just the additional money, because as Molly alluded to, it's moving away from a law enforcement model and a 28-day recovery period, because that's what the insurance company will pay for, 
to a lifetime. This is holistic in nature. It is a hub and spoke model, much more like a medical condition. And it means that we're talking about mental health in the majority of cases. And we're talking about wellness because an opiate probably brought you down the road to addiction, but it was not curative. It was palliative in nature. And it meant that we did not cure the original problem. So the other thing we need in addition to the additional money is the sustainability of the money. When we rely so much of these budgets on philanthropy and short-term funding, it means they cannot make optimal decisions and that especially impacts the mental health element of recovery services. It's small extra money. It is some extra money. If we listen to the folks on the front lines, we can do it. Thank you. So we're going to go back to one minute. The questions don't get any easier, I'm afraid, that, because the problems aren't that simple. Uh, New Hampshire ranks, by some accounts, consistently in the top 10 to 15 states in the country for wealth per capita. And yet, many of our communities suffer from high poverty and high local tax rates. Often, these inequities are compounded by poor infrastructure, lack of infrastructure, poor economic development, especially in areas of Sullivan, Grafton, and, Co and Coos County. If elected, what is your plan to develop business, solid education, property tax relief, and other things that would help these? these this reasons? is one minute. <laughs> All right, you know what? Uh, let's we'll do two. I think you're, as I read the question, I'm like this is two. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to too. We acknowledge that, but anyway, uh, this is a centerpiece of what I get so excited about about being governor. I've seen the best and worst practices of communities, counties, and states around the country. I alluded to it in my opening remarks. We have an antiquated system that oftentimes is 234 communities that happen to be drawn around a state border. And if you compared us to even red states, a Mississippi or a Wyoming, they would look at us and say, 120 years ago we stopped doing some of those things, because if you don't, you're gonna have amazingly high property taxes, and it's gonna eventually diminish the quality of your education, infrastructure, and public uh, social services. And I'm here to report that they were correct. <laughs> so we need to, as I said, we need to begin the cultural change, and that begins with not taking the pledge, the acknowledgement that we need additional revenue. We have the second highest administrative cost per pupil of any state in America right now. Because we use no scale, we've lost a quarter of our K through 12 population in 15 years. At the same time that we've added 10% more school administrative units, that is driving up administrative costs. And that means your property taxes have to keep going higher and higher just to stay even. An education bucket with a growing hole of administrative costs leaking it out. This is the same thing with infrastructure. If we ask Claremont and Berlin and Colebrook, and I'm sick of saying, I got, I got an aunt in Pittsburgh, my grandpa was in West Stewartstown, I love Kawas County. It is home. And I'm sick of people saying that the answer is more tourism. That is somewhat unintentionally condescending. Because if I look at a Colebrook or a Lancaster or a Whitefield or a Groveton or a Berlin or a Gorham and so forth, there is tremendous opportunity. There, are, there is the skeleton of a wonderful downtown economy. But when we ask in New Hampshire more than any state in America, we ask local governments to do it on their own, and then we complain that the quality of local governance is the problem. It's not the problem. It's that we have a 19th century style that doesn't acknowledge that state government is the way to deal with differences. We're gonna get sued again in the next couple of years for a Claremont area uh, type lawsuit because the discrepancies are worse now than they were 30 years ago, and we should lose that lawsuit. We gotta get on it, and I'd like to begin that in 2019. Thank you. Two, two minutes, Molly. Charlie, and, and thank you for that question. It's an important question. And you started the question by saying we're a wealthy state. And we are. And so that's why I find it very, very difficult and unacceptable that we have 44,000 children in our state who are food insecure. I can't live with that. I have to do something about that. One of the things I will do on my first day as governor is I will ensure that every child sitting in that classroom is not hungry that they have had food. Because we can invest in education, we can invest in infrastructure, and we can invest in so many things that are important in this state. But if a child is hungry, they cannot learn. And we, as a state of New Hampshire that's a wealthy state, cannot accept that. So as I mentioned earlier, I would repeal those tax breaks to the 3% of the wealthiest corporations and make sure that we invest that in education and public education, and that's investing in every child. Because if we do, if we do that, businesses will have the prepared and educated workforce that they need to move forward, small businesses as well as large businesses, to do and be profitable in their own 
in, in their business. Young people will be so excited about the opportunities that they have here because they have an education and they're skilled to work here and they know that we want them here. That we will have an innovative and a creative economy and we will continue to invest those revenues and that economy back into education, whether it's kindergarten through 12 or college, which needs to be affordable. That's what we need to do. I'm proud of our small towns. I'm proud of the culture of New Hampshire. This is a good culture. We have lasted a long, long time, and we do incredibly wonderful things in our communities. It's so creative. But we need to make sure that every child in those communities has the same education as a child in another community. So we need to work and to fix the um, adequacy education uh, formula to make sure that it's equal across the board. Every child deserves the right to go to school and have an education. We invest, we will get a return of that investment. As I said, it's the wisest investment with the greatest return. Just one other couple ideas. We have agencies in the state who do help uh, communities, uh, especially large industries, to, uh, to grow, to get started. We need those agencies to be looking at our small communities as well for economic development, not just the big cities. We have the CDFA tax credits. We need to expand those tax credits so that businesses will invest in their own communities. And those smaller towns that are struggling will see economic development and be able to move forward. Thank you. It's not enough time. <laughs> not enough Sorry. time. Some short ones, one minute before we go to the microphones. You gotta appreciate the brevity of this. What about guns? <laughs> one minute. <laughs> one minute. And we'll start with Well, that. I have always supported common sense, and I mean common sense uh, gun safety. Um, let me tell you uh, just briefly, uh, I have four children, as you heard, and I have seven grandchildren. Now, I will tell you, when my four children were growing up, I never, ever worried about them when they were at school if they would be affected by gun violence. But I worry every single day about my seven grandchildren. And as governor, I will not wait. I will not wait for a tragedy to happen here in this state. It is time to pass universal background checks and to work regionally within our, within our region to make sure that it passes and we have transparency. <laughs> we, we must keep guns out of the hands of children and domestic abusers. And yes, we must keep military-style weapons off the streets of New Hampshire. Our governor, the first thing our governor, Chris Sununu, did when he was elected is he signed into law allowing gun owners to carry a concealed weapon without a permit. I will repeal that bill. Thank you. Thank you. So one minute, and meanwhile, if you can do it in an orderly way, I would invite you to line up behind the microphone so we can transition to that part of the evening. Thank you. One I minute. spent a little time in the introduction getting to the weeds a little bit on this. It is. A four, there are four kinds of gun violence I'm trying to do something about. Homicide, domestic violence, the threat of mass shooting, and the big one, suicide. 93% of gun deaths in New Hampshire in the last two years were suicide. In the course of this campaign, somebody very close to me that I love very much made an attempt. It has changed everything about my family's life. I spent a lot of time in mental health facilities as a family member, learning on a first-hand basis about that, and I believe and I've talked to others who believe the same thing. If there had been a gun in the house, I think the outcome would have been different. I believe this as public policy before, and now it's personal. Now it is personal, and that's why I want a 48-hour wait period, because the states that have a 48-hour wait period see 52% fewer gun suicides than the states that do not. Get me on a stage with Chris Sununu on the first few days of November. Let me tell him what I just told you. Watch his face as he tells me why a 48-hour wait period is not appropriate. Then we'll talk about red flag law and universal background check and bump stock ban and uh, gun-free zones at your schools and many other things. We are with the majority of people in New Hampshire if we will play offense on guns instead of defense. Thank you.
Okay, we, we'll start over here and we'll alternate. If I could urge you to keep your question as succinct as possible, that would be great, please. Yeah, thank you. This is a question about backbone. Our state's largest utility is called Eversource, and the region's largest transmission utility is Eversource. They have opposed a couple of bills that just got vetoed. Uh, there'll be an override vote mid-September right after the primary uh, to defend and expand uh, solar net metering and wood chip based power. Eversource opposed both of that bills. How can we rely upon either of you, if we could speak, how can we rely upon you to show independence from this Eversource company that has for decades dominated the legislature? How do we know you're gonna be able to stand up to them and uh, help reverse this problem right now. So we'll keep the orders of I get that first? Steve and Molly, yes, please. I'm the only candidate for governor who's never taken a dime from Eversource or what used to be PSNH before. I've been against Northern Pass since my aunt found out it was going to go through her farm in Pittsburgh at the beginning of this decade. I've been upset about it for a long time. I, you got my word. PSNH and Eversource, I won't take their money. But in a related story, they're not going to offer it either. <laughs> okay? I promise, I promise you that. When we released our energy plan, 50% renewables by 2030, eliminate the net metering cap, dramatically fund with a progressive formula the energy efficiency programs so it's not just people that have the capital on the top end of the income scale who can participate in energy efficiency programs. These are some of the elements. And you know where we did it? We did it in front of Eversource. That's where I did it because I want them to know that change is coming, that I have not served in Concord, and that's not a good or bad thing, except for Eversource and other companies, and the lobbyists that they pay to be involved. They spent $300 million so far to try to get Northern Pass through the door, and they haven't done it yet, but they're gonna still keep on trying. If we do not push back at the state level with the equal force that has been pushed down over the last decade plus, then it will not get better, it will get worse. And if there's one place where there's clarity, and I'll be very straight up about it, this is one of them, we will lead the country on energy policy. And Eversource and PSNH, well, they've not been part of my past, and they will not be part of my future. Thank you. So we talk about clarity, and I'm saying it again. I want to be very clear today with all of you that I am the only candidate running for governor who has not accepted in this governor's race one dollar from corporations or from executives uh, from fossil fuel. My opponent has referred to PSNH dollars when I was in the Senate. And let me tell you how I stood up to PSNH. I passed, stood up to them. They were not happy with me and I passed the first group net metering bill that has propelled solar and hydro in the state. You asked, what would you do? Would you stand up to them? I did, and in this race for governor, I will not accept one dollar from corporations or executives from fossil fuel. I am the only one. Thank you. She, she didn't invoke my name. So I'll give you 15 seconds, and then another 15 seconds. Uh, number one, the bill you're referring to passed unanimously on a, on a, on a voice vote. Andy Sanborn voted for it, uh, and, among, and everybody else did. It, and five years later, we have one half of 1% of our electricity is solar. We need to remove the net metering cap. There was a bill several years ago that friends in the anti-Northern Pass community, and I count myself as one of them, uh, you voted the wrong way. There were some Democrats that voted the right way. Some Republicans that voted the right way. It dealt with when land could be used to do things beyond just reliability. It would have made it harder for Northern Pass to occur. You voted the wrong way on that one. If you don't believe me, travel with me to Plymouth and Points North, and you ask them who's the better candidate on issues like this. Molly, would you like to respond? Right, and, and I'm not going to get into spending the rest of the evening going back and forth here, but uh, I think I've been very clear, and I will just add, I have never supported the Northern Pass, ever. Um, and I will just say that uh, I think uh, the work that I did in the Senate, uh, and it was not across the board in a bipartisan, it was not across the board with 24 senators. We worked hard to get the first bill that has propelled, propelled solar um, hydro in this state, and I am proud. I am proud of the work that I have done, and I will stand by my record. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the left side, please. Thank Our you. Um, 
Saying that you have not supported Northern Pass or not, not supported the NED pipeline is different from opposing it. We've known for generations that climate change is a problem right here in um, Hanover and Lebanon in Keene and now the Greta Bridge pipeline from Manchester to Stratum. Our communities across New Hampshire are being attacked by Liberty Utilities, having frack gas pushed into our communities. And I want to hear a very specific reason why you would not oppose the Granite Bridge Pipeline and further, how you can explain to me the way that you would address climate change in an aggressive way that could explain a reason to not oppose that. So in other words, if you're not going to oppose it, what is the aggressive climate action you're going to take that would address the damage that will be done from that? This summer has been the one time that we are seeing more than ever the extreme climate emergency that we're in. We need some action. Okay. So we're going to... Molly first. You're first. Oh, okay. Um, thank you. Um, for the uh, question, and you and I have had uh, some discussions about that, and thank you for being so passionate about an issue that means so much to you, and uh, I understand that. Um, as I've said before, uh, we do need to wean ourselves from fossil fuels. I'm the first to stand up and to say, and we will do that. Um, but we need all the information first, and you've been supplying some, and I appreciate that in our discussions. Um, we're waiting for reports from the PUC as well. What I can tell you, and you can count on from me, from my experience in the Senate, is I said earlier, we need to have all the information before we make decisions, or as many of those here who have been representatives as well know, you could make a decision that is not in the best interest of the state. I will tell you, I will not support a project that does not lower our carbon footprint um, and in the state, and I will not uh, support a program or a project that is not, is not safe for the members of our community. So that's my bottom line, that's my value, that's what I look at, but I have learned that we need to look at all of the pieces before we make a final decision on a particular project, and we don't have all of the information yet. I haven't received additional information yet. Thank you. Thank you. Steve? Uh, I do have enough information to have an opinion on this. I oppose the Granite Bridge project, and it is because even before any additional information would come in, on a macro level, on what we know about other projects, this is a net negative for the state of New Hampshire, ratepayers, it has a negative environmental impact. Look, natural gas, because I mentioned earlier, it's almost two thirds of uh, the electricity. Uh, if, forget the environmental impact for a second. If you in a region over rely on one source of energy for your electricity, especially as they begin to trade in an international market increasingly, a volatile international market, even before you get into the very real environmental problems that one should oppose to. Even on an economic and a ratepayer basis, it will slow down the transition we need to make, which is why my energy plan says, in addition, no Northern Pass and no Granite Bridge. It's not just a NIMBY thing. It's also a what are we going to be? This is the defining of the future that I keep talking about. Going to 50% on renewable portfolio standard, eliminating the net metering cap, and leading the country on how we deliver energy efficiency programs. These and many other things, that's the future. Uh, this pipeline is not. Thank you. We'll go back to that side. Uh, thank you. Uh, recently, the legislature passed Senate Bill 365 that's gotten a lot of press lately. Uh, it provides millions of dollars of subsidies for biomass plants in the northern country, uh, north country, and um, also buried in the bill, and I'm very curious if you realize this, buried in the bill is a multi-million dollar subsidy for the Willibrader trash incinerator in Concord. And um, I'm extremely concerned about this. We had a very serious uh, run with Whale Brader in the Claremont area for several years. And um, if we consider burning trash clean renewable energy, uh, it's crazy because it's not clean and it's not renewable. Um, are you, each of you, aware that the Wheeler Brader incinerator is in that bill? And would you support sustaining the governor's veto of the bill in order to make sure that trash incineration is not considered clean and renewable? Thank you. All right. Steve, you'll be first. Uh, I would have uh, signed those bills, so it sounds like we disagree. But let me give you the context. 
Uh, when I look at dramatically increasing the percentage of our portfolio that comes from renewables, uh, one of the things that I learned as going through the process is how we define renewables. And you're right uh, in terms of using trash and defining that as a renewable. That is not part of the long-term plan, and I would seek, as an increasing number of other states do, to define renewables as uh, relevant to achieving metrics to, to mean uh, more truthfully what I think most of us believe a renewable uh, resource would look like. And so I would seek to get this off of the list of uh, uh, sources that would count. In the near term, however, uh, the biomass element of it, I think, is a valuable and useful part. And so, as is the case, and look, as a mayor and a city councilor, that you see this all the time, there are, there are sometimes imperfect elements to decisions you have to make. There was nothing more accountable than after I made a difficult decision, and then I'd go to Hannaford's the next day. And then people would tell me what they thought, the good, the bad, the ugly. When they said there was a cleanup in aisle six, they were talking about me. And so I'm comfortable, and so I am comfortable that this is a difficult decision. In the long term, I want to take trash incineration off of what we would consider renewable. In the near term, I would uh, have signed it and I would override the veto because I think we need to move that ball forward. But I appreciate and, and agree with the concern that you're specifically mentioning. Mm -hmm. Hey, Molly. Yeah, I, I do support um, the biomass renewables and uh, would agree that we need to make uh, their, uh, the part that is not safe, uh, uh, the burning, to make sure that we uh, ad ad address that and to deal with that. As I said before, I am committed to lowering carbon footprint and will not support a program that is not safe for the people of the communities, but we can make that safe. I will just tell you, I would have signed that bill uh, by not, by the veto, what has happened in the northern country on biomass is that now there is a risk of eight biomass industries closing and losing uh, over 8,000 jobs. Uh, that's not acceptable. 8, and so I uh, would have uh, supported that piece of Did legislation. Did you say 8,000 jobs? Yes. The, okay, our time is running out, so we're not going to get to everybody there, nor are we going to get to this, uh, unfortunately. But if you, I'll give you each a minute if you would like to kind of summarize your thoughts, having been through the questions. That would be lovely, and we'll start with Molly. Oh, okay. Summarize those. Thoughts. Well, your concluding thoughts that's here a, as we that's go amazing. out. Uh, I, you know, I, I will just end with where I started. Uh, I uh, am uh, running for governor because I want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity. I think you've heard an outline of how I would do that um, as well, uh, and uh, want to make sure that everyone does that, have uh, that opportunity. I stand on my record. I am proud of what I've done in the Senate, and I want to build on that. I am also very proud of many of the endorsements that I have received um, that have uh, moved our campaign for forward with a very viable campaign. I am proud to have worked and stand with people uh, like Senator Jean Shaheen, uh, Senator Maggie Hassan, Congresswoman Annie Custer. I did receive the endorsement of Planned Parenthood last week, have received the endorsement of the Teamsters, and also as well with the AFT and the NEA, all of the teachers here in our state. And I am honored by those because they understand, and I've worked with them a long time, they understand that I not what I do well is I solve problems by bringing the right people to the table, and I take ideas and I put them into action, and that's what an effective leader does, and that's what I plan to do moving forward as governor. Thank you all so very much. You're great. I, can I have one second? Good people and organizations all that Molly just mentioned, but in the campaign, we have said for a long time, we worry a lot less about who and we worry a lot more about how many. We've done almost 300 meet and greet events and it's thousands of conversations and it's over 30,000 people who have committed to supporting us in over 210 towns in New Hampshire. It is the most grassroots effort in the history of gubernatorial politics in this state. And it won't just make us effective as a candidate because we'll win this primary and it's the only way that we're gonna do something extraordinarily difficult to beat a first-term incumbent. It has happened one time, and we don't have the benefit of Craig Benson. <laughs> but we do have the benefit of this, the knowledge that we are at a moment that if we are willing to lead, if we are willing to define what the future of the Democratic Party, of the state of New Hampshire, and in our own small way, the future of this country is, in this time, we won't just win the election. We will. 
We will do it in a way that gets us majorities because we will be doing it in, in ways that are thematic and excite the base with the same message that brings over those people that are looking for a new home. A bold, unmistakable banner. No pale pastel shades. That is what the people of New Hampshire are looking for. If we give them the vision to know where to go, the competence to know how to get there, the courage to say it out loud, we will win in November and we will get to define our future lest somebody else does. Thank you very much. And thanks to both of you.